Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for another Monday This and That. And if you're new, just so you understand, right from the beginning of this video, these are potpourri style videos where I talk about a whole bunch of different things to either lead you back to videos where I go into more detailed instructions on how to do these things just to keep you updated on what's going on around here and what's new and what's happening in the garden to let you know of videos to get to come and to answer any questions that may have come in in the past week or so. So let's get to the topics of today. Now I'm pretty sure I'm going to put something about pineapple and mushrooms in the title so let's start with those. So right here you can see my pineapple vinegar and I did mention getting that that I was going to get that started in last week's video and I did and it's good and bubbly right here and it it needs to be stirred. Look at those bubbles, man. I just like to try to stir it every day. So I've been making vinegar from fruit scraps for many years. Pineapple is just one of the many. I use mango peels, apple peels, peach peels, anything where I'm going to take the rind or the peel off because I'm just going to use the fruit portion of the fruit. All that goes, even the pits of peaches and so on, and banana peels too goes right into making vinegar and it's just an excellent way you can make the most out of whatever it is you're dealing with and especially now that I can get organic pineapple I feel even better about getting back into making the pineapple vinegar and so what I'm doing right now is I can get organic pineapple from Misfits Market so I'm gonna start dehydrating some up for snacks for the future. The freeze-dried pineapple has a wonderful flavor and it's good for snacking if you're wanting something crisp. If you're want, wanting something that's more chewy and still has an excellent flavor, dehydrated is great. And so that's what I'm doing here. I plan on going ordering some more pineapple and getting that dehydrated up as well and getting some more pineapple vinegar going. In last week's video, I, f I failed to mention, though I did add the link, I meant to say that I'd be linking to the most recent vinegar making video that I think is the most thorough one I have. I have so many out there in the description box, which I did do, but just so you know, I'll be doing that again down below. So if you're new and you've never made vinegar, or you just uh, you're just wanting to know how to get started, you can go find that video and I go through a lot of details on how to do it. It's very simple. And yes, you can use any herb or produce to make vinegar, whether it be using the peels, just the scraps, or using the whole fruit, vegetable, or herb. And I've made vinegar of many different kinds, mostly from scraps or herbs in my garden. So anyway, there's that, and also I know you're going to be asking, but what do you do with all the different vinegars? Well, pretty much all the same stuff, though I do have a few that I set aside specifically, like my floral vinegars, because I think I'm still trying to work through some old nasturtium flowers from several years ago that I dehydrated up, especially once I realized how much I have. So I think I'm going to start another batch of nasturtium flower vinegar because it's really good for your hair. The floral vinegars all get used as a rinse in my hair. Sometimes I'll only use that to wash my hair with and it works really well. And uh, so nasturtium is one of those, just so you know though, whether you're using fresh or dried nasturtium flowers, unless you're mixing it with, with other fragrant flowers like lavender, it does tend to have a sulfur smell to it as it's fermenting and it's not entirely pleasant. But when you go to use it as a hair rinse, by then it's mostly a vinegar smell anyway and that smell does not remain in your hair. So there's that. Now let's talk of just a bit about the mushrooms. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail simply because I have two videos coming out that I've already shot, already edited, and have them uploaded ready to publish in a few weeks. So right here is the smallest jar, but I have two full pint jars of dehydrated mushrooms from the batch that I bought from the local young man who's not only a friend of my youngest son's, but is also distantly related to us because his sister is married to our nephew. So it's kind of cool. But anyway, uh, I did, he started a, a business and at this time, no, he doesn't have a website. He's just doing business locally. I don't know how far he plans on branching out, but he is going to be setting up a website and I'll keep you updated on that. I did go ahead and order some more lion's mane and this one, though this one here that I powdered up, I did specifically for medicinal purposes. I do want to do some experimentation with it in culinary uses. So I'm going to cook some up tonight and I'm going to try a few different things. I'm going to do, I'm going to try some stir fried. I'm going to try some fried in a little bit of oil. 
I might try breading some. I'm just going to play with it a little bit and then eventually do a video just on that and ways that you can prepare that. But the video I do have coming out about the dehydrated mushrooms is about how to dry them, the different types of mushrooms and the results you're going to get dehydrated and how you should use them. Because things like your shelf mushrooms, or a lot of them at least, such as chicken of the woods and turkey tail, while they all dehydrate up beautifully, not all mushrooms rehydrate beautifully. And your shelf mushrooms like that, because they're so very dense, don't rehydrate well. So they're best used in, used in teas at that point rather than in culinary dishes, unless you powder them and put them in your soup sauces and so on. But these mushrooms here are a mix of the Italian and right here, uh, the gray dove. You didn't have any Italian ready this last order, but the uh, gray dove oyster mushrooms, they are just wonderful. Both of them are great. They dehydrate up beautifully. They reconstitute beautifully. You just gotta soak them in liquid for a little bit. Doesn't matter if it's water, wine, whatever sounds good, a broth. Or like I like to do with this kind of the purpose of dehydrating is most, mostly for adding to soups, sauces, gravies, anywhere, anything that's already a liquid anyway that I gotta cook, just throw them in there dehydrated and they'll just reconstitute right up in whatever it is that you're making. So that's what I'm doing with those. But if I'm gonna use it in an omelet or something like that, or a scrambler that is, you can just reconstitute separate in a little dish with some water. It's same thing applies to shiitakes or using as a pizza topping. Mushrooms like that will tend to go back to their original size and texture. And I love the way mushrooms hold their flavor, no matter if you're eating them dried, just right out of the jar like this, or reconstituted. The mostly what I'm doing with the gray dove ones here is I'm just going to be dehydrating more up so I can keep adding to my stash of dehydrated mushrooms to have on hand. Anyway, be watching for those two videos. One of them is about the dehydrating and storing of mushrooms and their uses. And the other one is specifically about the benefits of lion's mane and the ways that you can use that. And then I'll also be doing a video soon on turkey tail mushroom, its benefits and how you can use it. And some other things going on right here is back here I have my ingredients out to make my multi-purpose cleaning powder. Mostly I came up with this recipe for the purpose of laundry and it's a totally new recipe that's different than any of the older ones I had that had soap in it. This is totally soap free. So it's safer for your washing machines but also for using as a scouring powder and it's great and it has other uses as well. You can use it to wash dishes either in the sink or in your dish washer. You can use it to clean your floors, but I find it's been the best scouring powder that I've ever used of any kind and the best laundry detergent that I've ever used. And you don't need a whole lot of it. So maybe a tablespoon, if it's really dirty, really large load, maybe a couple of tablespoons. Some people who've been using my recipe said that they went down to just a teaspoon for a regular load and that was plenty. So it just depends on how dirty your load is. But if you're interested in the recipe and how to make it yourself and how easy it is, it's far easier than the ones I used to make with soap, then make sure you open the description box down below by clicking on either show more right here, down here below my channel name or the little gray arrow on this side if you're on a smart device. And I'll put that link in there so you can learn about that as well as the other links I'll be adding. And now let me tackle a couple of questions that came in this last week. Now, one, two of them were in response to the video I did on taking care of your wood products, like this large kitchen board. I call it a kitchen board because I'm not using this as a cutting board that Patrick made. And then I have my chicken cutting board that Patrick made. And yes, Patrick has made and sold lots of cutting boards. I don't know that he'll get back into that, but he does have to, mill up some more lumber for those and some of his other wood products and it might be a while before he gets to that because there's so much going on right now but anyway um i did the video on how to treat that or even things like mortars and pestles uh the fruit masher like he made me here the tamper like he made here and anything that's wooden knife handles uh, wooden spoons, it doesn't matter. Anything that you're using, how to treat it, how to take care of it. So a lot, some people were talking about coconut oil doesn't it, does it go rancid. Now one guy said that it can, I've never had this issue. 
coconut oil in anything. I've never, I've stored it for many years. It has never gone rancid, no matter if it's the virgin coconut oil or refined. I've stored them all for many years without any issue. I've treated my wood products with it for many years with no issues of it going rancid. But the other thing that people were bringing up was I was told to use baby oil or mineral oil. Well, I do have some issues with that because mineral oil is a petroleum based product and I try to avoid using that. That includes Vaseline. I used to years ago use it for my skin, but just some things I've learned since. Now, usually when you're looking at the kinds that's used in baby oil and it's considered food safe, it's highly refined, so it is considered safer than your unrefined. Because the unrefined mineral oil that's often used in automotive is that is where you have to really be careful of getting that on your skin. It can cause cancer and that is also stated on the National, National Cancer Institute. But I think with your highly refined mineral oil, it's not so much a concern, but some people just prefer to stay away from the petroleum based products, which is me. I think it's a much safer choice to go with coconut oil. And baby oil, absolutely not. Don't use baby oil. The only difference between baby oil and mineral oil is that it's, and I would never use it on a baby's skin either. And that is because of the fragrance. So 98% of baby oil, this is just generally speaking, 98% of it is mineral oil. The other 2% is fragrance. And when it's listed like that, it's not something that's natural. So I would not use that either on my cutting boards or on my baby's skin or on my skin. So no to the baby oil on your cutting boards and so on. So just stick with a good coconut oil. Now the one gentleman that was talking about the co coconut oil, he said going with a fractionated coconut oil, it's not going to go rancid. And I appreciate his information. I personally just use the refined coconut oil and have never had any issue. It's held up very well for me. And sometimes you, you can even mix a little beeswax in with that. I personally decided I didn't like that. I just prefer the coconut oil as it is because it's much easier to rub into the board. So anyway, just to answer that question and the other question and related to that was how I clean it. Now with this big board here, all I do, especially because of the kind of stuff I do, I simply use a warm, damp wash rag and wipe it down real well, just like you would your counter. But when it comes with the to the smaller wooden products like knives and the tampers and the, and the whisks with the wooden handles, I'll put the metal parts of them, if they have metal parts, in the sink and wash those with soap and water. The handle I try to prevent using so much, using a lot of hot water and soap on, I just wipe it down because you want to keep those oils in the wood. So just cleaning it on the surface is all that's important or even rinsing it real well in warm water, nothing really hot and certainly no soap. I don't use soap on any of my wood products like that. Uh, it's just trickier when you're talking about knives and things where you do want to use soap and water on the metal part, but try to avoid doing it on the handle. So I never throw those things in the sink. I set it aside and then I just wash it separately by hand, not soaking it in any of the hot soapy water ever. Oh, and another thing I want to bring up just because of my recent video on the off-grid, you know, living partially off-grid. Now this isn't going to apply so much this time of year because, you know, we're in June now, but... I wanted to bring up the fact that some people are thinking about getting a wood stove, just a standard wood stove, not a cook stove, mostly a wood stove for heating the house. I talk about how to cook on a wood stove and I also have a video on options for wood stoves that you can look into according, depending on the size you need, the type you need and so on. So one video is about just cooking on top of a standard wood stove and yes you can cook inside them too. It's a little more tricky and it's going to depend on how much space you have but there are people that do it. We have done it in the past. So those two videos, one about the cooking and one about what to look for when you're shopping for a wood stove, I'll be linking to those down below. So yes I do, as long as we have a fire in the wood stove, which we don't today, it's actually finally getting warm enough that we don't have to have a fire going all the time, then um, I do all my cooking on the wood stove once if there's a fire in there. And because we're only just now starting to get some nicer, sunnier weather and, and uh, getting plenty of solar power, I have yet to pull out my uh, hot plates to set out here to cook on, but I'll be doing that probably today since I don't have a fire going. So those get used when we have plenty of solar power and no wood stove. But anyway, if you're interested in that, the, the living partially off-grid, why we do it that way, how we do it, 
Uh, I'll link to that video in the description box down below. It just published on Friday. And now for some quick art garden updates, I'm going to try to run through this real quick. Things are finally really starting to take off, thankfully. You know, this cold has just held on for so long, the cold, dark and wet, even though we are cooler, darker, and wetter than probably most places around the planet. It's still been an extended season of that for us. So everything has just kind of really been slow at getting started, not getting started at all. We've lost some plants because of the cold, but things are starting to perk up and look great and it's exciting to see that happen. My deck gardens are doing really good. So the other day when Jackson was here, we went out on the deck and I was able to get some cleanup down. A couple years ago, Patrick made me some shelves that I specifically asked for, for me to put more plants out there on the deck. The only bad part about that area is it doesn't get a lot of sun. It only gets the early morning sun and then it stays shaded for the rest of the day. So the only things I can grow there are things that tend to prefer shade. And what I found about here in our area, I didn't think we had violets that grew wild around here until my son had a trailer parked out here for a while that he was living in and I noticed violets were starting to grow under there and I realized here they actually prefer to have less sun. Any areas that got lots of sun they didn't do as well or at all. So what I started doing was, pull, was digging up all those violets once we got that trailer out of the way and we and I put them in pots those pots along there on that shelf and they're doing beautifully I'll put a little video clip or photo here they might not look great because I keep just cutting them down I cut leaves flowers everything and I'm dehydrating those up mostly for using in skin care but you can also eat them they're good in salads and so on and then what I did was the old old wood stove that we have sitting out there Instead of getting rid of it, we just set it out on their deck and I use it as a place to put more pots. I used to put strawberries on there, but then they didn't do super great because it doesn't get a ton of sun. But what I found from experimenting is that my thyme, as long as it's on the lower part of the wood stove, it catches more of the sun during the day and it's just enough for it to do fine. But the one when I had it on the very top shelf where the flamingo is, it did okay. So I did a little shifting around and put more violets on that in the pots on top and then transplanted the thyme that I had up there into some pots down lower so that it'll catch more sun and do better. Now it's not the only thyme I have. I have that thyme there on the deck and then I have my common garden thyme out front in another little strip that's on the south side of the house. Of It's just a narrow strip about that wide. And that's where I grow my thyme and my rosemary. They love it there, just the common garden thyme. The other thyme doesn't do as great there. It does okay for a while, but then it just kind of dies back. So I found it does better on the deck, that one. That's the foxley, and then one is kind of a citrus type thyme. It's not lemon thyme, it's something else. I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, those seem to do better out up here on the deck where it doesn't get full sun all day like on the south side of the house. So it's kind of interesting. So this is one of the things is as you start growing different things, uh, this is one nice thing about growing things in pots at first because you can move them around until you find out the best spot. But you can still dig stuff up and move it in other areas, which I'm always doing because things always change. Just like in the West Herb Garden, now that I have elderberries that grow out there, the elder plants get huge and then shade out a lot of my other herbs and now they're not doing as good as they did before the elderberries started grow taking off and really growing like that. So some things I'm moving around, some things love it over there. They love having that extra bit of shade. So as I watch these things change, as my garden changes, I just move stuff around accordingly and grow the things that I see like less sun, more sun, or drier soil or wetter soil yet. Even in our wet area here, we, we can find dry areas to grow things and that is right up against the house. That's why I grow the rosemary in that little strip out front because it gets the most sun, but it also gets the least amount of rain, so it stays protected. Because rosemary just doesn't like a lot of water and so finding the right place where it didn't get too saturated through our very wet winters took a few years and that was the place right there. So remember, utilize those areas right up against your house, if you're, especially if you live in an area that is either very gets very cold in the winter or 
is very wet like ours is. So we don't necessarily have really cold winters, but we have very, very wet winters. And a few other things, my the onions, I, I keep buying more of the green onions, and I'm planting a lot of them out there in pots on the decks, on both the front deck and the back deck. They're doing great. I keep planting more so I can have tons of green onions to harvest through the whole year. A lot of them I'll be using fresh. A lot of them I'll be dehydrating up for future use. The strawberries are taken off. My green stock, I haven't talked about it much because I've been kind of waiting for things to really start growing, but uh, the strawberries are, have been, especially in the green stock I've noticed, have taken a little bit longer to get started, especially those on the higher levels. And I believe the reason why is the one on the lower level has stayed more protected because of the other pots and stuff around it, it's just, and it's just lower down. But the ones higher up catch more of the cold, and that's why they've been more sluggish. But now that we're finally warming up, those are starting to come to life. So you can see how those are looking now. And then I also put a photo here of how they looked last year about the time the strawberries were coming ripe. So I'm expecting they might be a little more behind this year, but I should still be, by the end of this month, I should see some ripe strawberries coming on because I have lots of flowers out there, including the ones in the pots down low. So I'm utilizing all different things for growing my strawberries. So most of my strawberries now are all out front. They seem to like it out there on the front deck. And the one thing, one thing I like about that is slugs don't come up on my deck for some reason. So I keeping them up there in the pots, they are less likely to be attacked by slugs. But anyway, lots of things are doing good. So probably next week I'll start taking some more video clips and stuff and go more into detail about how the garden's going and maybe even do some separate garden related videos so you can see how things are going. But also I want to talk more in depth about the changes that we make. So as we adjust to the changing climate, as it keeps getting colder in our area every year, it gets a little colder. The winters keep getting longer while our growing season keeps getting shorter. We just keep having to adapt and change to make things really flourish for us. And sometimes it might be just giving up on a certain type of plant and switching to something that is more cold tolerant. And that's some of the other things that I've had to do. Things that did great for years now aren't doing as good as they used to. Echinacea is one of those. So anyway, be watching for more detailed updates on the garden down the road. So any questions you have or things you'd like to share based on anything I talked about here, go ahead and put those in comments down below. And be watching for those videos to come out that I mentioned. And don't forget to check out the videos I'll be linking to down below. Thanks for watching. Take care. And God bless.